Hi, folks. My name's Garrett White. As we're starting here, we're just going to play a song by Lucy Murphy. It's a music video. Hope you enjoy. We'll have this in the, the screen to share. Just kind of enjoy this music as we begin. Hoping more folks join us. Thanks for coming. somehow an ad crept in sorry about that everybody but thank you so much um lucy for sharing that with us and we look forward to hearing more from you uh later on in the presentation um but i just want to you know start out by welcoming everybody um again this is the dc oral history collaborative coffee chat uh featuring uh ward eight woods uh, my name is jasper collier and i'm the oral history project manager for Humanities DC, the State Humanities Council for Washington DC. Um, today's program will be recorded and the recording will be made available on the Humanities DC YouTube channel. 
Uh, so thank you. Thank you for joining us uh, for this month's edition of the Coffee Chat. Uh, the Coffee Chat highlights the work of those working to document and preserve Washington stories through oral history. The DC Oral History Collaborative began in 2017 as a partnership between Humanities DC and the DC Public Library and the DC History Center. Its overarching goal is to encourage DC residents and communities to tell their stories through oral history. The Collaborative has sought to achieve this by surveying existing collections of DC oral histories, providing free public training opportunities, and by offering grants that are supported by additional training and mentorship. To date, the Collaborative has supported through its grant programs over 50 projects across the city that have collected over 350 individual interviews. Many of these are already available at the People's Archive at the DC Public Library, where they, they are accessible through the library's catalog of digital resources, Dig DC. This month's conversation will be moderated by Garrett White, Garrett White of Ward 8 Woods, a grassroots nonprofit organization that seeks to rejuvenate and enhance the beauty, ecological health, and public enjoyment of the more than 500 acres of forest in the Ward 8 section of Washington, DC. Garrett is an inquisitive lifelong learner who would much rather be found writing poetry on a mossy log than spending too long writing biographies. He enjoys drumming and making silly faces with his niece. For relaxation, Garrett examines his own patterns of prejudice and racist violence that his privilege otherwise allows him to ignore. In 2020, Garrett, Nathan Har Harrington, and Ward 8 Woods helped start an oral history project called Over the River and Through the Woods, longtime residents in parklands of Ward 8. Today, Garrett will be joined by a panel of outstanding narrators who have contributed their time and their memories to the project for a conversation about the intersections of racial and environmental justice uh, that emerged from the interviews. Uh, please feel free to use the chat throughout the program for comments and discussion. Um, when we get to the question and answer portion, please try to use the Q&A feature to ask those questions so we can keep them organized and make sure to get as many of them as possible answered by the panelists. And with that, I'll turn things over to Garrett. All right, thanks Jasper. Appreciate the introduction. Hello everybody, my name is Garrett White. Um, before I introduce myself, I want to introduce the outstanding narrators or outstanding panelists that we have here. First, beginning with Brenda Richardson, just going to brief, uh, read these biographies. Uh, longtime Ward 8 resident and eco-feminist Brenda Richardson has been working on environmental justice, economic development, health issues, and welfare reform for the past 25 years. Passionate about using nature as a source of connection and healing, Ms. Richardson helps lead the group Friends of Oxen Run Park and is also a member of the Anacostia Park and Community Collaborative. Brenda, would you give us a wave, please? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Next is Miss D. Johnson. Born in Washington, DC, Miss D. Johnson is a grandmother and retired child care, uh, childhood care provider. Throughout her life, Miss D. has struggled to thrive among persistent stresses and unsafe living conditions. Miss D. advocates for the mental health benefits of outdoor play, and the need for community members who show up and acknowledge each other. Ms. D, would you give us a wave, please? Next is Mr. Raymond Coates. Washington, D.C. native Raymond Coates describes himself as, quote, an environmentalist and therefore a humanist who believes a green economy offers the best opportunity for social and economic equity. Raymond is also featured in the documentary film Lorton, Prison of Terror, and I'll link to that documentary in the chat. Lastly, Lucy Murphy is a native of DC where she is a vocalist who often leads group singing and she sunlights as a medical interpreter of Spanish and English. Lucy has a long history of community activism, especially working with children at risk. And now before I give more of an introduction about this project, I would actually like to invite Lucy to uh, maybe introduce herself and to sing a song for us. And Lucy, I wonder if you could explain in a few words or so why, why you sing, why music is so important and just I'll hand it off to you, Lucy. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Garrett. Uh, I'm Lucy Murphy. And uh, as Garrett mentioned, I'm a native Washingtonian. Um, in the previous, previous century uh, after emancipation, uh, some of my ancestors migrated from Virginia to Anacostia. Um, and uh, so it, I, I have some historic roots. Uh, currently, 
Uh, there's a Black Workers Center um, being renovated at the corner of Howard Road and Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue, right across from the Anacostia Metro. And uh, I direct the chorus for the center, the Black Workers Center Chorus. Uh, sometimes when I'm at the Anacostia uh, Metro, I notice uh, police uh, treating the people at um, the young, particularly the young people and the, the street vendors at Anacostia Metro in a manner that they would not treat the people at Friendship Heights Metro. And, uh, and I'm, I'm very, you know, concerned about uh, police abuse. And I noticed that um, the Metropolitan Police Department sends police to the state of Israel for training. Uh, and that prompted me to uh, share this song that I'm gonna share. And uh, also before I sing the song to answer uh, Garrett's um, question about why I sing. Um, I noticed at many rallies and demonstrations that I attended in my youth um, that the speeches would put people to sleep, but the music would wake people up. And, uh, and that singing together is a very important part of our tradition. So uh, this song has, uh, of course, we're on Zoom and we can't all sing together. Um, I have to ask the folks uh, to put yourselves on mute and sing along with me. Um, Palestine needs her freedom. Palestine needs our love. If you think of the Middle East in this modern time, you can't help but say the word Palestine. People there have lost their land. Some have lost their home. They live in other countries, their freedom almost gone. Palestine needs her freedom. Palestine needs our love. Palestine needs her freedom. Palestine needs our love. There seems to be no answer to give us the reason why people cannot live so no one has to die. We've got to take a stand for freedom, take a stand for truth, take a stand for justice. That's what we've got to do, because Palestine needs her freedom. Palestine needs our love, needs our love. Palestine needs her freedom. Palestine needs our love. People of all countries, of every race and creed, we need a new beginning. Let us plant the seed, plant the seed of love and let that love seed grow. Plant the seed for everyone so all the world will know that Palestine needs her freedom. Palestine needs our love. Palestine, Palestine needs her freedom. Needs her freedom. Palestine needs our love. And thinking of um, what Brenda mentioned to me a little bit earlier, I was uh, thinking that maybe I should share a few verses of a, a favorite song of ours. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us, only sky. 
Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for and no religion to imagine all the people living life in peace. You, you may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will live as one. Imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger or folks with empty hands. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. You you may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will live as one. Thank you, Lucy. And the world will live as one. Just diving in a little bit of singing here, folks, because Lucy mentioned that I know these speeches can be a little boring. So this is now my space to just to speak for a couple of minutes here, folks, and then I'm going to offer space for the, uh, the rest of the panelists to share their stories. But this is just a space for me to say, what's this project all about? Why am I passionate about it? Why am I doing this? Um, so before I share a story about the origin of this project, just want to give a couple of acknowledgments here. Um, first, first, I think it's important to acknowledge the First Nation people of where I was born, uh, which is the unceded Abenaki lands. And when I was living in DC, this was the unceded Piscataway lands. And also then the Nacostank or Anacostan people who lived on the southeast side along the Anacostia River. I'm acknowledging um, the histories of the original and ongoing stewards of these lands. And grateful as well to acknowledge that I wouldn't be here speaking without all the people who came before me, uh, ancestors, family members, my mom and dad, shout out to my mom whose birthday it is today. Love you, mom. Um, teachers, all these people who really looked out for me, who changed my perspective, who challenged my perspective. And really when I, when I moved to DC, I, I had the privilege to access so many different teachers, mentors, just average people who shared their stories, shared their truth. And that started to to crack the, the shell of the pillow of my privilege, if you will. And one thing that I realized with moving to DC um, and speaking with narrators who you'll hear um, in a couple of minutes, I realized that part of my childhood growing up in one of, the, one of the whitest states in the country, the privilege I was living under is almost like noise canceling headphones is the image. So I was realizing that I had lack of experience um, outside of my own world, if you will. So moving to DC, broadening my horizons actually broadened my humanity. And I want to I want to pause by saying that I want to acknowledge that there are these are real uh, issues that involve real people. This is real pain that we're talking about here. I want I want to acknowledge with gratitude that uh, it is hard to speak vulnerably. That takes bravery. I want to acknowledge as well that it is hard to show up, especially for white bodied people like myself. I want to celebrate that work and that choice to lean in and to have to engage in these types of dialogues to challenge our perspectives. So thank you for joining the space, and especially for those viewing in future. Lastly, I want to acknowledge as well uh, my own fear or feelings of shame or hesitation when talking about these types of topics. And I realize there's a tendency for me to want to reach for or wait for the perfect words or the right, the right words. So recognizing that, I just want to say, uh, you might be thinking, all right, Gary, You've been, you've been blathering on, you've been giving us tons of acknowledgements here, but what's this all about? This is where I share a quick story. So this is the first time I met Nathan Harrington, who is the executive director of Ward 8 Woods. And I, moving to DC, I was working with him, volunteering with him 
removing some of the trash and litter that was in uh, Shepherd Parkway um, in Southeast DC in particular. And, you know, always be, we would be, we'd be removing trash and Nathan was telling me, you know, this is, some of this trash has rested here for 30 years. This is the cleanest some of these forests have been in 30 years. And I remember thinking at the time, I remember thinking kind of this resentment started to bubble up in me. And I started to think, you know, I was, I was working and volunteering in, in Southeast DC. This is a primarily black neighborhood, a low income black neighborhood, as it was explained to me. And this resentment was in my, my heart. And I was feeling like I, this word, they, I started to dehumanize. I went, oh, they don't care. They don't want to do it. They don't want to do this work. And if I had just rested and accepted that type of prejudice, if you will, I wouldn't have actually, I wouldn't be here for one. And I wouldn't actually, um, anyway. So what I learned with speaking with Nathan and speaking with narrators who you'll hear in a second, I learned three things. I was incredibly naive and I was unaware of the emotional harm of seeing that litter, seeing that trash every day, passing by it. These are forests that are right along the street of where people live, where children grew up, where, where adults have grown up their whole lives. And I didn't acknowledge that that takes a toll on someone's brain, someone's body. And also I was not, I was naive to be unaware of the burden of trauma, especially unresolved trauma, let alone the ongoing daily trauma of poverty um, and, and emotional stress and grief. Um, and lastly, uh, it made me question who has the time to volunteer? There I was, you know, shuffling away in the forest for free because I had the time. I had the, um, I had the security and the safety to do this. And I realized that there I was pointing the finger at, you know, residents, uh, residents and saying, oh, you know, I'm, I resent you for not doing this. And in to totally unaware of the conditions and the burdens, um, you know, that were existing and festering. And lastly, last thing I'll say was a quote that a friend of mine had shared with me early on in my, uh, development as an, as an advocate, I was, as an environmentalist, he said, Garrett, the earth will be fine. It's, it's the humans. It's our relationships to ourselves, to each other that need our most immediate attention. And that kind of reprioritized my life and my advocacy. And it was that briefly, uh, that realization that made me understand that the status quo is unhealthy, that it's alienating and it limits our love. And with that, I'll say with, uh, in search of the whole picture and with a whole heart, I'm gonna zip my lip and I'm gonna actually turn it toward the first narrator, uh, Brenda Richardson. So Brenda, if you would unmute yourself kindly. Um, so the question I have for you, Brenda. Um, hello, Brenda. Hi. Um, is just to, to say in your interview, in your oral, oral history interview, one question that you had answered so beautifully, um, or just so personally, was the question of describing disfavor is a word that I've heard you use in your interview and in your advocacy. And in your interview, you described disfavor using sensory details. You described what it feels like to be disfavored, to live in a disfavored community, what it sounds like, smells like, you know, what are the sights and sounds. I wonder if you could just bring the sense of disfavor to life for us, whether it's for a child, for a family, or for for adults. What does this disfavor feel like, sound like? How can you bring that to life for us, please? Thank you, Garrett. Um, so I want to, before I share that, I want to go back to something that you said about the trauma that we experience in our communities. And it's not just trauma, it's collective trauma. And then when you also mentioned that we don't volunteer, we're exhausted after being exposed to collective trauma on a daily basis and the pandemic contributed enormously to that trauma. Uh, after a while, you're just exhausted, angry, and in despair. So as I, I live in Ward 8 and um, I got tired of people calling our community marginalized and vulnerable and poor. And there are all these very unpalatable words. So as I was trying to figure out and understand my own trauma, I realized that our community was showered with disfavor. 
And what, what does that mean? Showered with disfavor. I hear gunshots. There's so much noise in disfavored communities. It's not just gunshots, but it's loud ATVs and motorcycles and souped up cars. It's loud police cars and, and sirens and fireworks. They've already started shooting the fireworks and it's just April. What does it smell like? It smells like marijuana. I live in my house, I don't smoke, but there's this prevalent smell of marijuana in the air that I'm exposed to, whether I want to uh, or not. And what does it feel like? It feels like, um, it feel, it's very painful, I would say, because it feels like going down a dark hole that you can never stop to get out of. So as I look at disfavored communities, that's my interpretation of how I see it, feel it, and smell it. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Brenda. And we'll, and I hope to hear more from you as we continue to trot along here. Um, shuffling over to yourself, Miss D, um, similar question. I'm actually gonna, this is the first audio clip that I want to bring into the space. We've heard Brenda describe disfavor um, in its many forms. And this clip that I'll reference, I, want, I would invite you to introduce it for a second. Jasper, this is number four. This is uh, Miss D clip number four. And Miss D, this is the clip where we describe where you moved from 11th Street across the Anacostia River. Um, and you described the change of your living conditions. You described um, some real details. I wonder if you could describe in a sentence or two what this clip is all about, and then we'll play the clip. Okay, so the clip, I guess, is me describing my first encounter with Ward 8, because I come from the Capitol Hill area where right off Capitol Hill, and it's really nice and quiet and grass and everything grows. And then Ward 8 was a culture shock to me, kind of devastated me, kind of. And that's what you're gonna hear. You know, it went, like on my, on my street, 209 11th Street, when you go out front, there's a yard and you have grass on one side, you have grass on the other side, you have a peach tree, we had a rose bush, we had, my grandma called it a Mother's Day bush. It's just greenery and flowers and even though it's that old fancy ass house, we still had grass. Like you look like everybody's house had grass. Everybody's yard had grass. Uh, you know, gates and people do their lawns and you know, rake the leaves, and it was just stuff that I was just used to seeing, and then when we moved here, um, I moved from 209 11th Street, um, Northeast to 2554, um, Shannon Terrace, and let me tell you something, when I look out my window, there was a fucking wall right there, that was a fucking wall, I had, I was like, what, it was a wall, like, Oh my God, it's still to this day, it picks me up because you're talking about somebody with this vivid imagination who's used to laying in the grass and swimming from trees, and now I'm looking at a fucking wall that says F you on it, or RIP somebody, or uh, I don't even know. Oh, shit. Yeah. It still bothers me. It still bothers me. Sorry, you guys, but that was real. It's raw still bothers me so yeah sorry i understand and just to give you a, if if you feel comfortable is there anything that you would um any other words you'd want to voice um and as you reflect from this clip um, just that um you know i don't think i think people look at war eight and they don't see the people you know the real people um the children the untold stories. And I think that's what it is. They look at us all in disdain or like, oh, we're all, we don't all want to live like this. We don't all want to see the trash. We would like to clean up the trash. We, we I have grandchildren that don't want to see the trash. I, I just don't, we want better for ourselves in our community. I just think we get a bad rep. That is all. I hear that. And 
hope to hear more from you soon. And we'll and and I promise we'll be uh, we'll be putting the, the grief uh, behind for a second or two, and we'll hold space for um, celebrating the joy that we can bring into the space. But with that, um, Raymond, I'm going to transition to you on a similar topic here, uh, Jasper. This is Raymond clip number two. And Raymond, if you could introduce this clip, this is where you describe uh, growing up in DC, but you were right across the river. And I wonder if you could describe what you saw and how you describe the differences you saw. And then we'll play the clip. I think you're muted. Hi, Garrett and everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, I always thought of my city as a, a, a place of really true sharp contrast. You know, even when I was a kid, I remember that in, in this city, I remember being coming out of my house on 12th Street Northeast where the lights were off and, and, and we were cooking food with a extension cord from our neighbor's house. And um, the water had been cut off with my pop. They had went outside and cut it back on. So we, we still had water because you could do that back then. But behind and two blocks up from me was Capitol Hill. Right, and, and and you could behind me was was was, and at the corner was the council member's office, and I I, I really want to point that out because I remember walking to the corner. I was like seven or eight, and our lights were off, and I remember looking at the corner, and I could see uh, council member's house, and the lights was on, and she had a nice little Cadillac, front, right, uh, and she was back. Uh, and I, I say that because I remember also when I lived on Capitol Hill on 12th Place, when Lincoln Park had a whole lot of trees. And the trees for us served as a border, right? Like on the other side of those trees were rich white people. That's how we saw it. They lived in nice homes, those nice cars. We, you know, we go over there to, to commit crimes. So I always knew that I lived in a city where poverty was lived within spitting dif distance of wealth. You know, like what I wanted was right there. I mean, like it wasn't like across a train track. Or way up. It was right there. And this, this, all my life has been that way. It was always right there. Um, Thanks, Raymond. I guess for now, just interrupting to say, we'll come back to you in a second after we play the, the clip. Okay. And we'll invite you to, to reflect on the clip. Thank okay. you. So, poverty for me was. I think I was genuinely confused growing up. Because things didn't kind of make sense. Like it was so different for me than what I saw. You know, I mean, some people grew up in poverty in rural areas and never know. I don't know if you can do that in the urban area. Because in my city, we live so, we live right next to wealth. Right, I mean, I mean like around the corner could be a very wealthy person, right? We live in the seat of power. I always tell people that's why we may not be educated, but we're not stupid. Because we hear all the conversations all our life, right? 
I mean, it's a political town, so you confront it with it from, from the time you don't think. And Raymond, um, as we're as we're as we're uh, discussing the the word, you know, disfavor, as Brenda has has described it, I remember, you know, living in the Capitol Hill area and going there for protests, and you see, these would be um, employees who would be paid to pick up trash along the side of the road, and it was just something where I didn't see that same um, that same position available in communities east of the river, in particular. Um, I wonder if you could just reflect. Uh, for yourself, uh, as, you're, as you've heard your words, any other thoughts you would share? You know, I, I, I didn't expect the reaction that I had to that uh, tape. You know, to hear myself say what back in real time the feelings that that confusion produced. Like I feel it right now. You know, and uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, the question again. No worries. Just anything that's on your heart, your mind, that you want to voice. You know, it, the, the idea of just paper. I remember in the second grade, probably the beginning of most of the tribulation in my life, publicly anyway. I remember I was standing, I was in second grade, and I had gotten into some trouble in class. Uh, and as we was going up the step, there was this principal, she said, rather large uh, Caucasian lady. And I was saying to her, call my mother. You're supposed to call my mother. And she turned around. That first she said, your mother ain't got no phone, which was true. Then she turned around with that paper and backhanded me in the face. And this out of sheer reaction, I attacked. You know, and I think about that, about how much of my life was shaped by the things I had to respond to. You know, and like, it, it, and when I think about uh, what my community is now, I can see how I got there. And I can see why my contribution has been so unhealthy. And it stemmed from the confusion in the beginning. You know, um, yeah, it's- um, I, hear you, Raymond. I hear you. And Raymond, I guess the next clip I, um, that will come, just giving you a moment here. I wanna come back to a clip of yours um, that I think will be uh, really, really wonderful to hear. Um, and hopefully it'll lift your spirits up, remind you of all the love around you. And on that subject, reminding, seeing the difference between teachers that really act with compassion, uh, as opposed to teachers who who do what you described. I want to move back to you, Miss D, uh, with, the num with the clip, uh, with clip number one, Jasper. And Miss D, this is when you're describing yourself as a preschool teacher and you, you were describing your love of the children of Ward 8. You're saying these kids get a bad rap. I wonder if you can just describe in a few words what we're about to hear, more of the, the root of your love. Uh, root of my love, child care. Um, you're about to see, again, culture shock. Um, working in a Caucasian 
Child Care Center and all the great things they are awarded. And then coming back to Ward 8 where I'm needed and they have no supplies, no nothing. So that's what you're about to hear. Because again, like I, my where I am right now, I feel I do. I, I my car went comp. My building is locked. My maintenance men are not creeps. Um, my resident managers they're nice. Um, my large room is secure. I feel safe. Um, but there are places where I wouldn't even go. I won't now. I st I won't. <laughs> I won't move there if they pay me to live there. Um, I've worked places where I had to, because I love War 8. Um, I moved to Northeast and moved right back to, to War 8 because, again, as a preschool teacher, I felt like I was needed more here than any other ward. These kids get a bad rap, and they're mostly misinterpreted. They're like, you don't know what they come from. You don't know what they're dealing with at home. Some of them don't get hugs. Some of them don't get meals. So I just want them to know, like, you know, any child that I've ever, I feel like, taught or kept, um, they're going to feel loved. And they're going to be told that you can do anything you can do, you put your mind to. So. And, Misty, I have to add, because I think the last sentence that was cut off in your clip was, I'm going to tell them they can do anything they want to. And you said, because I want to inspire. I do. I do. Always, so I'm good with just one, just one, so. And you had mentioned at the start, I know the, the clip was a little confusing, but you mentioned the, um, you know, the difference between these childcare centers that are funded and ones that are not so funded. And you're describing that, you know, you're, you're acting from a place of love and from compassion. And I'm, I wonder if you would describe for us some of the teachers or one example of someone who really, uh, gave you compassion, gave you love, made you feel seen, or maybe you were reflecting on not feeling seen in a time of your life. This was, I wonder if you could describe, uh, this was, I believe, your elementary principal, Mr. Baldwin. I wonder if you could bring so, him to yeah. life for us. Thank you. Mr. Baldwin was my elementary school principal. And I got to state that as a child, I never felt seen, never felt heard. Um, so um, my, Mr. Baldwin was a short, bald head man. You know, he was a tough guy. Um, but always fair. Um, but mind you, this was elementary school. Now here I am an adult and I had an issue with one of my kids um, and I went to the superintendent and guess who it was? It was Mr. Baldwin. Now I noticed that it was Mr. Baldwin, but what shocked me is that Mr. Baldwin said, hey, Barnett, I remember you. That quiet little girl that I thought that nobody saw, that nobody heard, Mr. Baldwin saw me. Um, just for wanted me to be it, made me want to be an educator because again, that man had to see a trillion, trillion kids. And he remembered me. So it was just it made me feel good to be seen. So I will never forget Mr. Bowling. I don't know if he's still at the superintendent, but I will never forget him for that one thing. And I don't even think he knew that, like seriously. So you never know the impact you're gonna make on someone. So do that, do something. And appreciating that uh, and wishing to celebrate it. Uh, I also, I wanna hold space for yourself um, before I transition, Misty, just to, you know, you're mentioning that, you know, you're, you know, you're looking after the, the kids that you've worked with. How do you do that? How do you enliven the lives of the children that you've, uh, that you've worked with or encountered? What's an example? Um, I see them, I see them. So, um, and I hear them, I listen. Um, I grew up in a time where children were to be seen and not heard. I see and I hear my kids. So therefore, um, if I have a child that is acting differently than they were the day before, I wanna know why. And I'm not gonna outright ask them why. We're gonna you know, play and you, know, you have to earn kids trust because they don't trust people. Our kids don't trust people because people have turned on them. I am one of those people who do not trust because of that. So I was a kid, so I can relate to them. So I get on their level, I see them as the little people that they are. And I speak for them. I'll always do that. So, yeah. I can't give an example because they are a million. There are a million. Um, 
the most tragic was I was volunteering actually at my kids elementary school and I saw this little girl every day this particular day she was not herself so I said hi instead of saying her name I just said how are you pretty lady and or pretty whatever I said and I said what's your name I don't know why I asked this little girl her name to this day um but I asked her her name and she said a total different name and I said well welcome to our class and what brings you here and she said you know it still grabs my heart but she said well when I have to when she has to take a shower with daddy I show up and so we, of course we had to go into action because this child is being abused at home but again I don't know why I did that that day but this is why I'm in child care because this is where I belong because of things like that that I caught and got her out of that situation so um I'm thankful for the gift that I have with children so yeah, that's the most tragic. I hear you. I appreciate you sharing that with us because it's real. It is. And I guess just, you know, it, you know, awkwardly transitioning here, but it, 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 I want to transition to Raymond actually because it, you're mentioning Misty being seen, you know, being held in a way um, by the people who support you and you doing this in the story you shared with this child. And it, for me, it makes me think that. You saved that child's life. The, the comp compassion that you that you practiced, you know, protected that child. And transitioning to you, Raymond, this is where I, uh, Jasper. This is clip number three. Raymond, I wonder if you would describe for us a similar scenario. You know, this is when you were you were free from prison, and you you returned to your community and your family, and you received a reception or a love. I wonder if you could describe that for us before we uh, play the clip. I'm glad you asked that question because one of the things that I do want to highlight is that, you know, as I said, that those things sent me on a journey. But when that journey came to an end and I came back home as an adult to my community, I think the greatest inspiration, the most powerful thing that kept me on this road was the love for my community. I mean, it was tangible, it was real. They, they listened to me, they heard me. They saw value in what I see, they saw value in me. And you know, I've lived a lifetime, you know, struggling. So it don't just go away. I had some some, some bumps and, and grinds since I've been home. But I always credit my community with teaching me where I was needed. Helping train me with the tools I needed to respond to the things that I thought I needed to respond to in my community. So I've always said that. It was it was my it was the love that my community gave me that created the opportunity for me to grow into the best of me, the better of me, the best things that were in me all along. Uh, and, and to hear how uh, the sister approached her job and it is so real listen man like the thing that triggered me was a was a was, was a teacher that smacked me and today i hear from a teacher who took the time to understand why a child was reacting the way he was reacting it's just it just it just highlights the importance of developing that which is in our community already to heal, to help face challenges that that community faces. And she's a great resource in our community. You're here. Thank you, Raymond. We'll play the clip and we'll come back to you. If it were not for my community loving me the way they love me, 
I might, and I'm dead serious. I'm not saying that like some kind of, I'm talking about, they literally, physically loved me. Honored me when I came home. Listened to me. Validated me. And protected me like I was a treasure. And kept me on these streets 20 years. My community did that. Hear me, man. Prison didn't do that. I came home to a community, man. I don't know where these, we well, always knew they was here. Because I grew up, I seen them when I was growing up. I just didn't pay no attention to them. But when I walked out that prison, and I walked into these people's arms, they've been hugging me ever since. But I'm hugging back now, baby. <laughs> I'm hugging back. Cause they told me how to hug. They told me that, you know what, man? You don't have to hate. You don't have to be angry to protect yourself. All right. And Raymond, what 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 you said right before the clip was so profound, and I'm, I'm, I want to bring it forward. It's the idea of, you mentioned that your community, or, you know, the people who supported you, they gave you an opportunity to grow. You mentioned into, into your whole self, your full potential. I know we've spoken about this before. And in your interview, you mentioned the quote of, your community was like an acre of soil for you to plant yourself in. I wonder if you could describe the idea of like preparing that soil, growing that soil, and again, reflecting on the clip of the love that you were shown by your community. Thank you. The idea of my community as a soil for me is the result of me looking back, looking at my community and looking back over my life from the lens of my environment. Uh, and when I look back through that lens, I, I, I see how, what my community, how my community responded to me was in keeping with the natural order of things. They, 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 they provided a rich nutrient soil that I could grow in, right? I mean, like they fed it. It was there for me. It was a place, a space for what, what turns out to be the better me. To lay root and to blossom. So it's so much about our environment that can teach us so much about not only our lives, but the lives we've lived and the life we can live. So when I, when I, when I talk about the community as a fertile soil for me, that's a realization that came to me as a as a reflection of, of what I see in the natural world, if that makes sense, you know? I mean, like, it, it, it's, 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 it's a true diagram of how nature works. I hear that. And even thinking of, you know, what Brenda had said at the start of the phrase disfavor and, and hearing words like exhaustion, you know, coming from disfavor, and feeling like what, as I mentioned, you know, musing on what does this do to a person? You know, how does this harm their, you know, their self-image, you know, their sense of self-worth? Raymond? So, so, so this is, for me, the burdens of poverty that I've known, especially now when I look back on it from an from environmental perspective, from a, from, from a naturalist perspective, you can see how the abuse of each other is played out in the abuse of our environment. Like you can see in communities with hot surfaces, you can see hot temperatures. In communities with sharp corners, you can see 
disagreement and fear about what's around it. And communities where you see hard-hearted behavior, you see that the hard hearts walk on hard surfaces. When you see despair in, in, in these communities, and you look around, just look around physically, and you see tree boxes with dry, cracked soil. You see trees that you got to walk around. You see what should be beautiful is trashed. And this is another system that we respond to. I mean, we, we, we and people say, well, you guys, you, you 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 don't care about it. You you if it's been that way for 30 years, many of the people here was born to that. Okay. So 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 this is what they heard. It's not what they did. So I, I, I say on that to say that uh, when you have a system that's so starkly different, or at least the way one community is depicted, and the feelings that those produce are so starkly different from the man right across the street. You, I mean, you do have a mental issue here, don't you think? I mean, you, you have this, this feeling of the diminished self-worth. And that is that 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 diminished self-worth is reverberated throughout the community because when you talk of my community, you talk of all the ills of the community. You 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 you, you ignore the uh, Brenda Richardson, the, the 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 best of what we produce, and so that our strengths are never revealed and never developed yeah. because they cover so much with the scars of poverty. Hmm. Yeah, and and even thinking, Raymond. Um, you're mentioning, you know, diminished self-worth, feeling like this word disfavor. How can someone, you know, feel, you know, feeling not invested in or feeling whatever, not favored? What does that do? It's kind of like um, you, your image of the soil from your community. It's like that that love is so fertile, but disfavor is not fertile. You know, oh. kind of diminished self-worth, shame. You know, this is not a good condition to grow in, but this is the condition that people are forced to grow in. So is it any wonder that poverty is persistent? Is it any wonder that poverty is persistent? And what does it say, and what do it do to the, to, to the brother or the sister who is told that, I did it, you should too. What does that do to him? When the whole time he, he's been living, He's been warned. He's been threatened. The whole, his whole life. If we don't do this, this is gonna happen. If you don't get that, you won't get this. If you don't act this way, you can't get that his whole life. I always say that we come out fighting up. But I always wanna emphasize that these are not things we do. These are things we inherit and that we respond to. They do not, they do not indicate our character. And even, um, tr thank you, Raymond. And transitioning, um, you know, incredibly seamlessly to, to Miss D, but just reflecting briefly, Raymond, um, you know, I want to, Miss D, this is a, 
uh, Raymond, or excuse me, uh, Jasper, this is going to be clip two for Miss T. It's the space when you're describing, Raymond, of, um, you know, in the face of despair, as we're talking about disfavor, in the face of depression, you know, mm -hmm. which is the added weight of disfavor, in my opinion, it's the sense of want, uh, feeling alone, you know, and I'm, I guess this whole event centers around the, the fact of encouraging the sense of you are not alone. People who may be listening to this now or listening to this in future, but there's, it's dangerous for people to, to rest in that space of feeling alone. So in that, in that sentiment, I want to kick it over to Miss D in this space of what this is an ex this clip, Miss D, is an example of you in the face of this despair and this, this depression, actively pursuing joy and cultivating joy in the imagination of, in the, in the imagination of your grandchildren. I wonder if you would just introduce this clip for us in a couple of words. Thank you. Uh, you're muted. You're muted. Can't hear you. You have to unmute. Okay, so I, it's kind of hard for me to describe this script because I don't know, um, but I suffer from depression and anxiety and post-traumatic stress, and in that, I found solace and joy in my grandkids' faces because you can't be sad looking at their face. They're too cute, um, but it makes you want to be better. It makes me want to be a better person, not just fake it because I'm good at faking it until I make it. I did the work. Go to therapy, people. That's my that's my message to the world. Go to therapy. Period. I appreciate so, that. I mean, I'm, 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 I want to hear the clip. I'm excited. Oh yeah, we'll come back to you. Thank you. I see. Well, you can, I always say hot bread and butter. Um, and it's like I don't even know if people know that game, but hot bread and butter. And um, we did hopscotch. We did a uh, tag free tag. Um, we had a game called Devil in a Pie, and only people from DC is gonna know what that. Like somebody had to be the door, somebody had to be the devil, and then everybody pick a pie. And the devil would knock on the imaginary door, and he's like, "I want a pie," and he asks for the pie, and if you want a pie, you have to run around. And you know, if you, you couldn't just go run straight to the base, so you had to go around and do a lap, and it was kind of like Duck Duck Goose, but. You know, but no, I love that game. I love that game so much. I have to make sure I played that game with my kids. So they played all the games I played. <laughs> I made sure my kids played double dutch, double the pie, even for four corners. We bounced the ball and counted. So I made sure they did all those because to me that was like the ultimate childhood. We played outside. We played kickball. We got sweaty. You know, ripped a hole in your pants because you fell. So I wanted my kids to experience that about my childhood because I did enjoy that. We played hard. We climbed trees, we swam. I had scars to prove it, you know, so I enjoyed that. These kids don't play outside. And I understand why though. These kids can play outside like I did because they're gunshots. Yes. They are not active, they're in an active gunfire. Uh, a one year old, these babies are getting killed. A grandmother got shot. I can't unsee that. You know what I mean? A baby riding on her scooter, just going home from coming from the circus. She got shot on her scooter. This is what we live in. You understand? So this is why I play with my kids outside because it's an experience that every kid don't have. Um, a lot of parents don't want to play with these kids. They don't play with their kids. And I always say, that's because y'all don't like y'all kids. I love kids. I embody them. Um, I get dirty, I get messy, um, I still fall, you know what I mean? Um, but I just want to be the sunshine in some of these kids' dark places. That's it. Pretty much I want to be the love that they're not getting. Um, so if your kids, if I see a kid and they're by themselves and I'm outside with my kids, I'm going to invite them to play with me and my kids. I'll give them snacks. I'll give them juices. I'll give them all the love that I was not given. So I think that's what I want to be for my community, for the kids in this community, because we do see this shit every day. Excuse my language, but to see a to hear a baby getting shot, that makes me think of my grandbabies. I don't like that. I will never recover from that. Our whole community is traumatized from all of the shit we see on the news too. So I don't even watch TV, guys. I never watched TV in four years because I am traumatized to the point of no return. So um, I'm gonna do as much as I can for the kids I, I come in contact with because of the things we see every day, period. 
Can I respond directly to her? So sis, I want you to know, 62 years old, and I know, I had a part in that messy experience, okay? I had a part in it. Mm -hmm. But I do want you to know, sis, that I appreciate you being here. It, and, 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 and because it was you who just kept loving me, I'm gonna love you back, okay? And, and I'm gonna dedicate myself to, to creating an environment where you can feel safe, you know, and we can increase the work you do with our children, okay? I promise you. You hear me? Thank you, Raymond. It's terrible. See, this is what I said to you about how some of the principles, the principles of the spirit is nothing but the principles of life. Because it was people like her that stood back. So I got responsibility. It's just like that, getting your man's back, man. It's no different to me. They had my back. You know, and, and, and so I just need them to know that uh, there's a whole lot of us home now, man. A lot of us guys out there, man. And, and, and all of us feel the way I feel, man. A lot of us understand what happened to us and what we did. And we are out here working, man, to, 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 to reverse that and, and to make it uh, different. Um, because you're here to what? Well, just just conscious of time and yeah. just just hearing you, Raymond, when you mentioned a feeling of responsibility. Um, I want to just, Miss D, if you feel comfortable, I'm I'm seeing that the sense of feeling of responsibility, showing children that they're loved, showing children another way, if you will. Um, I want to invite you, Miss D, just to describe you're playing these games with your kids, you're going outside, you're describing, you know, seeking solace um in the world. I wonder to describe why do you, uh, why is it important for you to show these kids how to play? What are you, what are you doing for them? I feel like I want to give what I didn't have. Like all, like okay, so we played outside. These kids can't. So if I'm the safe grown up, that's going to take the time for them, just a few minutes. It don't have to be the whole day. Kids need 45 minutes outdoor play legally. That's what we say in child care, um, to play. You can't dedicate yourself for 45 minutes to play with these babies, 45 minutes, 35 minutes to walk them on the trail. Just to know that a little girl, if, you, if I have an extra toy, I, it's just this simple. I didn't have toys. I did not get them for Christmas. We had to go to this place. My mom had to get a shoe slip, a coat slip. Everybody slipped to get us stuff. So if I have a little bit of extra, extra truck or a toy, and I know that little girl over there, and I see she don't got it, I'm going to give it to her because I didn't because somebody did it for me and for the people who did for me. So it's, it's just, we have to pay it forward. All the stuff that we did not have or it wasn't done for us, to us, by us, that's my job. Nobody assigned me that job. The ancestors that came before me assigned me that job. I was born into this job. I wouldn't trade it for the world though. So I died doing this job, that's my dash. Your dash is that the impact you give back, you know what I mean? For free, whatever you'll do for free, that's your passion, period. That's my message. If you'll do it for free, that's your passion. And I have to, and I have to add in a personal note, Misty, I know you've, you've been, pardon the cliche, you've been a shining light in the lives of many children that you've encountered. Add myself to that list. You know, I know I've said this to you as well, but uh, quite literally, you know, the stories that you shared and the vulnerability that you shared, that was some bitter truth, some much necessary medicine. I wouldn't be the person I am today if it wasn't that I met you as well as, well as the other narrators I spoke, but specifically for yourself. Um, so on a personal note, thank you for your bravery. And just briefly, as we're discussing, you know, uh, as we're winding our way, you know, Misty, you're describing like playing these games with kids. 
these adults, you know, myself, I'll add this to the list. We take ourselves so seriously. We, uh, we, rush past, we rush past stuff, especially when we're talking about the natural world and the beauty around us, let alone the beauty within us and the beauty between each other. So I guess I, I admire that you pause and that you take that time to play to kind of like show different, uh, different options for children. And this is where I seamlessly transition back to you, Brenda, uh, where I invite you to share uh, more of your work. Um, well, if she's still with us, but describing Brenda's work with the Friends of Oxen Run Park um, and just some of the outdoor learning that she engages in and, and schedules. Um, Brenda, I'm not sure if you're still with us. Nope, it's okay. Um, just transitioning even more seamlessly here, back to Raymond. Uh, Raymond, as we're describing active pursuit of joy, cultivating you know, a more vibrant world, you described kind of, you know, a 180. You started studying plants. You started recognizing, you know, again, the beauty around you. Um, Jasper, this is clip number one of Raymond's. I wonder if we could just close with this clip and Raymond, I'll ask you to uh, reflect on this clip. So this is Raymond clip number one, please. So I got the idea of a garden city because in my community, the environment is so hard and so harsh. Sharp corners. Pancake places. Flat, hot, and ugly. We have so many transportation hoods right where we live at. Buses, cars, trains, all meet up there. Spitting and spewing. We got diabetes, we got respiratory issues. We have emotional issues. I believe that if we use our natural resources as they were meant to be used. We can clean up our community, make jobs, and reconnect to the law that cannot be argued or debated. Thank you, Raymond. And, and just as I pass back to you for a reflection, uh, I'm, I'm interested for you to reflect, you know, you're mentioning this garden city vision idea, almost feeling like inheritance children Inheriting a garden as they're born is something that you mentioned as a visionary idea in your in your interview. But this word uh, you're talking about, you know, uh, flat surfaces, <clears throat> sharp corners. I'm going to toss the word curvy at you. How does the word curvy? Uh, how is the word a part of your garden city vision idea? Off to you, Raymond. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so this is this, this is the part where, for me, I know the art is not lost and that there's much to be gained. Because our natural environment, see, I believe everybody has this bone deep desire to be happy, everybody. And I believe that our natural world provides cues towards happiness. Like, I, I envision a community where people walk down meandering streets, places where there are colors, come out your house, there's blues and yellows instead of dead and brown and cracking and death, where, where the children, Play is everywhere, <laughs> right? I mean, like, we can build gardens in our city that teach our children, that help people reconnect to what is certain in our lives. And that is the natural world. That's going to teach them. It'll teach them how to read. It'll teach them how to write. It'll teach them how to do math. It'll teach them how to feed themselves. We can create this garden city and create jobs, good jobs, 
for people in our city where a, a man, a boy can see his uncle working. Where he can see his auntie is the one to do that. And everybody hang around there. He can, he'll be there to tell a man, don't throw this in there because my aunt got to clean that up. So the community is vested in what happens in and what happens to it. It has a direct natural investment in it. We can create, I believe we can create vibrant communities by, by introducing true environmental justice. And true environmental justice cannot be achieved if you are not also a humanist, a one who believes in, in the natural element that is a human being that could be nurtured, that could be cared for, and that can grow and produce fruit, healthy fruit. I believe that we can create a community using our natural environment, all the green and beautiful spaces we have in, in Anacostia. I mean, we have some of the Oh, beautiful spaces. And we ain't got bad land after all, it was tobacco country. You know what I'm saying? So why not take what we have in front of us? And green infrastructure, the premise is this. The way we respond to our environment, we imitate natural processes and use natural materials normally found in that environment. I submit to you that you can do all the stormwater management you please if you don't also support the humanity in that environment. You've done much of nothing. That's the apex creature in the environment. <laughs> if you don't fix that, you don't fix nothing. Because it's going to get undone. You can service it. But our community don't need more services, we need solutions. And the solution to a natural challenge is a natural product. What's already there? That's the very premise we work on. So if we want to, we have a great opportunity here, Garrett. I mean, this is a wonderful opportunity right here. Because this environmental justice is an opportunity to produce justice, not only for the natural environment, but all the things included in that environment, all in one stroke. We are very fortunate. Thank you, Raymond. And I guess just as we're as we're wobbling our way to the end here, I'm just gonna, as we're kind of short on time, I'm, I'm looking for questions from the audience, you know, toss a question if you want, but I guess as we slowly transition out, I would just kind of pass it back to each of the panelists here, each of the narrators, including yourself, Lucy, if you're available, um, just to offer, maybe starting with yourself, Misty, just kind of a closing statement or a reflection, also just a, a vision, you know, what do you want to put out there? What are these goals uh, that you want to see for either your family, yourself, where you live, Misty? I want to live in that city that uh, Raymond is talking about. I want to be an <laughs> in that city. Period. That's you it. Because that's that's it. Like really, we need to get back to nature, and just remember that we can't people people. We need to stop trying to people people. Get with like-minded people that think like you, and have fun. Have fun. Enjoy life. Smile. Laugh hard. I mean hard because I do daily. So if you have a laugh, call me. I'll. I guarantee I'll give you some. <laughs> Raymond, get with Garrett, get my number. I need to talk to you, sir. You, no, need, I need, to I need, no. <laughs> you need to be in my village, sir. That is it. But oh, people, no. show people, people. You're only in charge of yourself and how you react to people. So just govern that and you'll be fine. You know, <laughs> if I wanted to leave anybody with a word, it will be the evidence 
of the can do, the will do of my people. Because you are here, sis. No, this is real. Because I remember you. It was people like you. I mean, straight up, straight up, we know, right? <laughs> you know, you took, you, you, you knew me, you knew who I was. It wasn't like, oh, I feel sorry for him. It was all now, man, we need help. <laughs> you took part over here, remember? <laughs> and, and, and you, he was, you're still here, man. Still, my mama's still here. Big mama's still here. She's still around, right? Cause you're here, right? I'm a big mama, that's our girl, right? All us got one. We need her, don't we? And I'm, I'm just saying, I'm so proud that you're still here, right? And, and, and I'm so proud of having the opportunity, man, to like, at least attempt and begin to do my part as big papa, okay? We're going to get this done, sis. We're going to get it done. I guarantee you. We're going to get it done. One other For thing. Sure. One yeah. other thing. This, that we look, the vision that we see, sis, is not something that we have to get, okay? It's not even something that we have to achieve. In my opinion, I believe it's a place, it's a space that's already there that we got to go to. I agree. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just draw from it. I mean, this is what really happened to me. Sis. This is not a joke. This is what really happened to me. This is how I came to see my life so different. Okay, so we're gonna get this done. Thank you, Raven. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gad. Hey, Robert, got you, Raymond. And just as we have a few minutes, just, um, you know, I guess I'll just invite maybe yourself, Misty, and, and Raymond, um, Lucy, if you're available, but just maybe any closing shout out. Any, any people you think you wanna lift up in the space, who's doing the, who's doing the good work? Lucy, I'll start with you. Any closing reflection? Anything you want to voice to bring into the space? Also, who's doing the good work? Who should people know about? Thanks. Uh, you should you should know about Kamone Freeman at We Act Radio. Uh, in the back of uh, We Act Radio, there is uh, a garden um, and uh, a, a compost uh, operation uh, for the garden and uh, a place where, in good weather. Uh, people can gather and uh, and listen to music, uh, listen to speakers. Um, so we act radio is is what I would like to uh, to lift up. I'd like to highlight an idea, and I'm so glad you're here, Luz. I'd like to have one day a Garden City Festival. I even have a, a theme song for it. it. It's called All My Favorite Colors by Black Puma. Yeah. And, and I'd like to have different communities and cultures displaying their gods, you know, sharing their gods, you know, so that, see, God is just a celebration of life, right? So we sharing gods, you know, like, you might grow differently from me, a different product. I can get to taste what you grow, right? And we do it, we do it in the spirit of oneness. We're a small city, we can do that. I mean, do you remember the Black Family Reunion? <laughs> yeah, we can do a 
hundred things in this city, right? I missed that. You talked about on the armory at the armory. Yes. And, and let me show y'all some how incredible this is. Uh, now you know that's where the Black Family Reunion took place at. When they redid that place and a thing over there we used, and we still across the street. Now a basketball court, now a football field, now a baseball diamond. That's where we live. That's where many of us learned to drive in that part of life. And they redid it and it don't look like nothing that we use. That's incredible, don't you think? So one of the things I think we could do is we can, because I don't think that sort of thing is intentional. I think it's the result of how the system practices. Right? So I don't, I don't want to demonize the people, but we, we need to have these community events where the whole of the community gets exposed to the whole of the community. You know what I'm saying? So we, yes. can, so we can have our each in mind when we do things. Does that make sense? Yes. Raymond, I, I would like to say that I put my number in the chat. So I want you to call me, Miss D, I would like to hear from you because I know you have a lot of good ideas. Um, and the Places of Worship Advisory Board is planning to have um, a, a health fair, a community health fair, and this idea of the gardens, people sharing their gardens, um, their, their produce. So, Pictures from the gardens would be uh, would be something that we would love to include. Mm -hmm. So please let, let's be in touch. Okay. Thank you, everybody. As of now, the last thing I'll just say, um, and I'll close with a quote from Miss D, uh, which still resonates with me. Just reminding folks, uh, just to check out Humanities DC, check out Wardy Woods, check out Friends of Oxen Run Park. There's tons of links in the chat, uh, as you've have you seen. Um, also, all these recordings, especially the, the one that we've been referencing through this event, these are all available on the DC Public Library website or the, the online archive Dig DC. So you could check that out for many different uh, interviews, oral histories there. Um, and the quote from Ms. D that still resonates with me as we end um, is just, let's learn to fall in love with ourselves again. Yes. Kind of what it all comes down to. Really grateful for everyone joining me here today, just kind of offering little glimpses of their truth, shining their light. Really appreciate it because I feel warmer for having joined the space. Um, so look out for similar events in future folks on these topics and other ones. Um, with that, Jasper, if there's anything else to note, we might just be, we might just be closing up. Yeah, I would just like to thank everybody, um, you know, all, all of the panelists and Garrett on behalf of Humanities DC for, you know, sharing your stories, your honesty, your truths. Um, being vulnerable in this space, I think that, you know, that um, is something that requ re requires a lot of courage. And I know that it did for the uh, oral history project that you all participated in as well. So, you know, thank you for that. And thank you for contributing to the um, archive. Um, uh, as Garrett said, those oral histories are all available in the People's Archive on Dig DC, um, as well as, you know, many other recordings that have been done by communities across the city. I would also just like to say um, Humanities DC does have the oral history grants for 2022 are passed, but there are other grant opportunities with Humanities DC that have recently been released. So if you're looking for some support to tell your story, the story of your um, community in Washington DC, please do check out our website at humanitiesdc.org for more information on those opportunities. But thank you all again and thank you for this wonderful program. <laughs>